yesterday or the last teaching we introduced the matter of spirit soul and body and in the diagrams that I've drawn on paper we have diagram and horizontal we've shown from the Thessalonians epistle that we consist of a spirit soul and a body not body soul and spirit but spirit soul and body this is the order of importance according to God uh, I find with God the most important part of us is with our spirit and it's the least understood and then our soul and then our body now we usually quote it body soul and spirit because that's the order of importance that we attach to ourselves our body and then our soul and then whatever that is spirit and we really don't know what that is and as I mentioned in the last teaching psychology has its problems because they're dealing with a a dichotomous instead of a trichotomous being he believes in a body and whatever's in there and there's only one other thing in there but the Christian has been enlightened to know that he consists of spirit soul and body now I put them in these diagrams on papers spirit soul and body and it's a proper diagram that shows the ascendancy of the supremacy of the spirit the intermediacy of the soul and then the subjection of the body there is no one more important than the other as a man thinketh in his heart so is he in his bodily conduct the body is actually the slave of the inner life my body does exactly what it's told to do my body doesn't think my body but my stomach doesn't think it just does what I tell it to do if you're on a diet that'll help all of you just repeat it my, my my stomach doesn't think my stomach doesn't think if you're dieting your body as you have it right now is a product of your inner life and we're not going to digress and talk about healing but you might want to think of that when Jesus healed people he healed the person not the spirit not the soul and it's not it's true that that he healed the disease but he healed the whole person because healing is actually and we go to the other diagram here which and you don't have them but it shows the spirit is the core of our being spirits outer some soul outer circle another body uh, the Holy Spirit and the believer is joined to our spirit Paul said if any man be joined to the Lord he's one spirit the Holy Spirit and my spirit are joined together in the sanctum sanctorum of my being they're one blended now the Bible says that if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you where at where does he dwell at in the spirit this is where he dwells if he dwells in you he shall quicken your mortal bodies now your body is mortal it's death doomed it mortal means death doomed it's doomed to death mortal but God has promised that if you'll let the Holy Spirit govern in your life that he'll keep your body patched up and keep you alive until the time is ready for it to go home or by the way of the grave or by the way of of his second coming so the spirit is the center of our being now you'll notice on this other <laughs> diagram which you don't have there's a dotted line between spirit and soul now that's done deliberately with a dotted line now one of the reasons why modern philosophy and psychology cannot grapple with the human problem usually more questions than answers they can't do it properly because they don't understand the spiritual aspects of the human being the spiritual factor now as we pointed out in the last teaching the unregenerated man and the unregenerate man spirit has been cut off from God it doesn't mean he's dead the unregenerate man is not in touch with God the spirit is capable of God consciousness the soul is capable of self-consciousness and the body is capable of world consciousness five senses but the unregenerated man the spirit having been cut off from God is not extinct it's not dead when people say a man is spiritually dead many of them believe he's dead his spirit doesn't exist or shrivel up dead inside of him but death is not sensation death is separation what it means is 
his spirit is alive, but it's separated from his his proper relationship with God, his true abode. My spirit is made for God. It's not made for devils. As St. Augustine said this centuries ago. Man is made for God, and he's restless until he returns to God. It's the restlessness of the spirit. Now, what happens when a man is not a Christian? There's a demonic force that comes into his life. And that's in every unregenerated man. A demonic force. Now, that demon may be a, a demon who is given to uh, lust, and what we call bodily sin, or he may be a very sophisticated demon. And I've met them when people. But whatever he is, that demon is now in charge of that spirit, that human in spirit. And because he's in charge of that spirit, that spirit is now, now here we got the uh, five senses, the body. Spirit is now, that demonic spirit gives interpretation to the information center, which you bring through your senses. The only information that you can get is through your senses, the five senses. And as you bring information through the senses, you send it up here into the laboratory of the soul. There he goes. Now the spirit under the demonic oversight is the one that gives the interpretation to the knowledge that you bring to the five senses. Now, as I mentioned in the last teaching, that's why we have all of our problems in everything, education, psychology, all of it through demonic oversight. Now, if a psychologist or a counselor is dealing with a person and he's dealing with a, uh, simply in terms of a body and a personality, well, whatever, they divide that up. Well, however they do it. He doesn't believe in demons in the first place. You can't know they're dealing with it. If you mention devil, he laughs at you. He doesn't believe in the Bible. By and large, there are Christian psychologists, and I don't mean to belittle them and uh, do the whole profession in, but by and large, they don't believe in that sort of thing. Now, in every unregenerated man is demonic activity. Paul says in Ephesians 2 that the unregenerated man is energized by satanic powers. Now, the psychologist can't handle satanic powers. So he's not even capable, able. He may make some adjustments inside you, but he can't handle satanic powers. And so people cannot find ultimate help or answers in human manipulation of the psyche, psychology. It cannot be done because, well, this is the suke. This is the pneuma, spirit, suke, the mind. And this is the soma, senses. Now, psychologists only deal with the soma and suke. But the Christian sees the soma, suke, and pneuma, spirit. There is a spirit factor that they don't recognize. So that this is why we have ministry of deliverance. Because there's great need right at the very beginning of the life of conversion that the person releases, realizes that right at the beginning that they're being translated out of the kingdom of darkness, Satan's kingdom, into the kingdom of God, which is light from the power of Satan unto God. Satan has been a very real person to them in their life. He's governed and dominated their lives. He has organized their thought patterns and their thought patterns have produced their behavior patterns. And so he's been overseeing their conduct. Now they're converted and conversion starts. Now their conversion starts with properly done with true repentance and right understanding of what is involved in baptism, what is involved in rising to walk in newness of life and be filled with the Holy Ghost and to walk in the spirit that will involve what's called, for want of a better term, conversional exorcism. Satan has got to leave. He's got to leave. He's got to get out. He's got to go. Now, when he leaves in the human spirit, he gets back into a relationship with God and the Holy Spirit comes in and he is joined with our spirit using this diagram over here. And one of the first things he does is he starts to read our mind. Now, the mind is a comprehensive term for the soul. 
It takes in all the rational ideas and processes, the ability to receive information and relate it, correlate it, make judgments about it. And the spirit now moves down into the soul and he starts to clean out the soul. He renews the mind, he restores the mind back, back to its original intention, if not better. The mind was originally intended to be the storehouse of divine information so that working out from the spirit and the soul, a man is behaved himself like a, a creature of God made in the image of God, not an animal. Now, I'd like us to look at a few scriptures as we go on with this. It's kind of a backup and a review of those who, who didn't listen to that first tape. You should. And uh, first Peter chapter three, where the apostle Peter is dealing with husbands and wives. He's telling the wife of an unbelieving husband how to win her husband. He says this, now after you have told him the gospel once, don't nag him now. Don't nag him. Don't leave a New Testament open on the toilet seat every time he comes in to read it. Scripture verses everywhere, on every place he goes. So if he's socked or he gets a little miniature Bible, that's a form of magic. He comes in there, three guesses to put this testament in there. Now, don't tuck, tuck traps on, uh, tracks under his pillow and, and all the other little things that we leave lying around. He knows who put them there and what they want. If you told him the gospel once, that's it. You're done. Now, that's not my subject, but he also says that having given the word, don't nag him. Verse 2, but rather let him observe your behavior. That's the old English word of conversation or behavior. While they behold your chaste conduct to behavior, your submissive and blameless conduct. And then he talks about their adorning. That adorning, the word adorning, the Greek word means cosmos, which is interesting. Ladies, put yourselves together nicely. I don't know if cosmetics comes from cosmos or not, but you should think it does. And I'm getting out of my territory a little bit, but I, after 40 years, I can stay there. I can talk on it a little bit. But I think one of the things that many Christian women do with unsaved husbands is after they get converted, they feel it spiritual to look like an old potato sack, no makeup, hair all up in a bun, long old skirts on. And <laughs> that man still wants to be his Bible says that that man wants to be proud of you there's nothing wrong with being cosmic put together nicely look pretty go to the, go to the beauty shop put some makeup on wear some decent clothes nice clothes he wants to continue with what he married I don't mean old bar fly but I, I mean something beautiful I can't imagine, imagine God making a beautiful woman drab he did not take a beautiful woman to say you got to be drab now I think this is one of the big problems with the church is we misinterpret what God is doing or did at for sure. I've ministered to several people in 40 years with, with them and good to them and talk to them, kind of straighten them out. Not like I had all the truth, but I had some of it. A couple of women that had asked me for prayer and so forth, they had lost their husbands to something. They ran away or whatever they did, left them. And I asked him, what for? What happened? Well, I didn't, and, and I'll be honest with you. I told him, I have known you for several years now, a couple, two or three. You don't wear any makeup. You look plain Jane. You don't dye your hair anymore. It's all gray. It's sprinkles there and there. And that's okay. You wear these plain Jane clothes. And uh, I guess he thinks that's pious or whatever. Did he meet you like that? No, no, no. We didn't meet like that. I said, when did you start doing that? Well, and when I started going to church. This is when, this is how... Godly women hold themselves. And he smoked cigarettes, so I nagged him all the time. I told him he couldn't even be saved. You can't even be saved smoking. He went to the altar a few times, but he could never kick them cigarettes. And I always told him the truth. That he's not going to be saved smoking like that. And I smoked back then. A while back, I pulled out a cigarette and started smoking it. And he said, she said to me, I didn't know you smoked. I said, I do off and on. I put the cigarette out and said, let's pray in tongues for your husband. And she said, how can you do that? 
she started crying. How can you do that? And I said, smoking's not a not the best thing in the world. And it's probably a demon that comes with it off and on. But that's not going to stop me from going after God continuously. And I will cut, stop smoking. And I will stop doing a lot of things. But one thing I won't stop doing is telling the truth. I think might try to shut me up. But stop smoking cigarettes doesn't get you in heaven. Stop doing a lot of other things that doesn't get you into heaven. And just maybe keep you out of prison for your conduct. Maybe you won't be harassed by the devil so much. I don't know. Doesn't seem like to me that you trade one, one bad thing that God doesn't like you doing. It would kill you in the first place. But I don't think it'll stop demons from harassing you. Jesus was harassed by the devil continuously, no doubt in my mind. But I told her, I think you've preached the wrong gospel to him and you ran him off. And she said, finally, I did run him off. And now he's with a, a nice woman in town and they have a nice life and I want him back. And I said, is he married to her? Yeah, they got married. We were divorced uh, five, six, seven years ago because you told him that he can't get saved because he smokes. You kept telling him. Oh, I told him all the time. I left uh, tracks for him to see. And I said, that was one of us that said, you are one, you were the example of what you just did. She eventually called me a false prophet because I wouldn't pray with her to get her husband back that he divorced this woman and come back to her. She never did put any makeup on. She did once. Looked pretty decent. And she said, it's just phony. I feel phony that I'm letting people know, you know, I'm not letting them know the true me. And I said, oh, okay, well, okay. If that's what you're going to do and you'll bear that out. That happened more than once. I always felt it was wrong. I've been in congregations where the men look good, dressed well, new shoes and clean and suits, a lot of them. But the women look like they're wearing gunny sacks, long old dresses down to their, the floor, plain. Their hair is long or up in a bun, usually in a bun. No makeup, none whatsoever. Now this is how godly women dress, huh? I didn't want my wife in bondage like that. Thank God she won't be. She's pretty. She wears her makeup, not heavy, wears nice clothes, not showy pretty pretty uh, now you're to win him with your behavior with your christian conduct not your cosmos with your adorning let it not be without that outward adorning he said and here's what you're not to depend on he didn't say you're not to use this he didn't say you're not to he did say you're not to depend on it now look at it who's adorning let it be let it not be that that word adorning of of plating braided hair or fixing your hair nicely. Don't depend on that. But he didn't say don't do it. So that's not your salvation. That's not your de depending on. That's not the thing you depend on. Or the wearing of gold, jewelry, pretties. Somebody said, I'm sure glad you're, you're talking about this. Thank God, let's hit this hard. Let's hit it good. The women need this. Oh, yeah? The women need this like you need a hole in the head. No. The women don't need this because they have to have it. Women have been the target of a lot of abusive teaching in some of these areas. That's what they've been. And I believe that if you say well, she mustn't plate the hair and she wasn't wear gold, and in the next verse it says she mustn't put any clothes either, right? No. Wear those gutty sacks. No good clothes. Well, but, okay. God forbid that I become the, the starter of a new denomination. Wear decent clothes and charismatic nudists where they can't even wear clothes anymore. What kind of weird junk is this? Believe anything. Say anything. Now what he's saying is don't depend on these things salvation-wise for your husbands. For goodness sakes, ladies, keep yourselves nice for your husbands. That's what it says. It'll cost you men something, of course. Uh, a little cost of makeup and uh, hair nice and nice dresses take care of business be proud of her how many of you women listening to this agree with that that's what you should do now how many men are gonna lay wait for me after I finish this teaching get me later there's the Lord now you, you, you'd be nice for him dress nice for him and be decent Keep yourself nice. You're the girl that he loves. Stay that way. Now remember, you got to add a dimension that you didn't have before. What is that? Verse 4, let it be the hidden man of the heart. And that which is not corruptible, 
even the ornament of a, a meek and quiet spirit. Now, don't give him Jesus for breakfast, dinner, and supper. Now, when he comes home, he shares with you his day. Honey, I had a bad day or a good day or a bad day. Now, if you love Jesus, it wouldn't be different. If you love the Lord, it wouldn't be that way. And that's the last time he's going to have a bad day with you. <laughs> I'll tell you something else. It may not be too long before he's telling some other woman he's having a bad day. I think you'd have something to say about that, too. Well, if he was a real man. <laughs> if he was a real man, what? And had Jesus. <laughs> now, let's let's look at another one. Romans 7.22. Romans 7.22. Paul said this, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. The inward man. The hidden man. The inward man. Ephesians 3.16. Let's just hop around a few more here. That he would grant unto you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Second Corinthians 4.16 Though our outward man perish, the that's our body, of course, that the inward man is renewed day by day. Now, I think about this and I see outward bodies and I see the bodies, that are, and I've seen many of the bodies that are in the process of perishing. The hair is getting thin. The choppers are getting few. They don't hear as well as they used to. And the Book of Proverbs tells this. The windows are getting dim. And the pillars of the house are getting shaky. That word, the hour's dying. This is what he means when he talks about a deaf, doomed body. Your body is going to perish. There'll be an outward perishing of the body. But if you're a child of God, you have within you the spirit of eternity. You have eternal life. And already you have inside of you the spirit which is going to effect your glorification at the resurrection. He is already inside of you. That's the spirit that's going to make sure your body live by a fiat of God's decree, the Holy Spirit is going to change your mortal body and your mortality into immortality and your corrupt ability into incorruptibility. And you have the guarantee of that now already in your spirit. Now, how many of you have had this experience before, especially in the beginning when you first enter in to that ecstatic experience of the new birth and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How many of you, sometime or another, was sure you could fly or move or <laughs> bi-dimensional or some other thing? Spiritually, you became a new creature, a supernatural creature. And you know you were there. That happened to a lot of people. It just was a wonderful time. It's time to go. It's, you know, you didn't know if you didn't know if it's ecstatic like it should be, it's it's it, you everything got renewed except your body. And it's not a vile body. It's it's a. It's not vile, and if a lot of Christians just let the body go, and they don't take care of it like they should have. It's called the body of who their humiliation. It humiliates you every time you try to do what the spirit wants to do. Other times, they let their bodies go. Uh, I've had Christians say, "Well, what's my old body anyway? We're going to get a new one. I'll just use it up." It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. You better take care of your body. Glorify your body in your body. Glorify God in your body. That's why you should take off the weight that you need to take off. Do the best you can get there. Uh, especially when you get older. Do your exercises. Do what you're supposed to do. If you drink, slow down on drinking or quit drinking because it's poison you're putting in your body anyway. If you're smoking cigarettes, quit smoking. If you're taking drugs, quit taking them. They kill you. That's all poison. It's designed to kill your body. Some of it's designed to make your life longer. But even the side effects of some of the drugs that you're taking are worse than what you're taking them for. <clears throat> so glorifying your body glorifying god in your body is really important it's the body you're going to live in throughout eternity anyway he's going to resurrect that body i don't know how but he's going to do it he said he would out of the oceans were blown up but whatever happened to it burnt cremated back and forth out of the sea out of the ocean it's mountains you're coming with that body <clears throat> what is that is resurrection i don't think resurrection is recreation it's resurrection he's going to raise that body i don't know for how i don't know why or he's gonna say are we gonna know one another in the afterlife yes you will i'm gonna be me and get a new body and it'll be that body 
Not a new one. It's going to resurrect the old one. Uh, they, res they recognize You'll be recognizing who you are. Now, the Bible says you'll be like Jesus. Well, you'll be like Jesus. You'll be glorified. But it'll be, it'll be your body. Glorified. No flesh and blood. It'll be flesh and spirit. Just think what heaven would be if everybody there looked like Jesus and had to figure out who they were by talking to them. I'll look the same. You kind of look like Jesus. You look at Jesus. You look at because we're all going to look like Jesus. Who are we? No, that's very simple. It's not even hard. Now, I think we'll be better than we look now. Yeah, resurrected. Little nip tuck here and there, you know, no more moles and tags and tigs. And, you know, your hair will come back and your hearing will come back. Your sight will be there. It's always been said and told me that we'll, some of the old people said, you know, I think we're going to be around 33 years old, mature, 33. That spirit that's within you, and it's only real that I'm dealing with this right now, is, is to show you that you right now have the Holy Spirit who one day is going to raise you from the dead and give you an incorruptible body. You already have that spirit within you. He's there already. You know that every time that you get a healing, it's a preview of the resurrection. Every time. Keeps you together. Every time you get a healing, whatever it is, and I've had some tremendous healings in my life, but every time you get a healing, he's patching it up a bit. He's patching it up, keeping you alive for a season. Now, I haven't had faith to pray for my hair, but there's some who do, or my teeth, or whatever. Amen. The outward man is perishing. So I can't pray against that. I just can't do it. But I can pray for my health as a 70-year-old man. I don't think you have to be all weak and sickly. And I know the Lord is... is uh, is, is, is talking about the resurrection and I don't think it's morbid that I'm going to heaven when I die. It's not morbid. It's, it's where I'm going. It's what, that's where I'm headed towards anyway and then the resurrection after that. Paul said all things are yours, life or death. So when the time comes for me to die, time for me to go, the devil's not going to kill me. He lost that ability to kill me when Jesus went down into Hades and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave from him. He lost that ability. It's gone. Now, Jesus, the Prince of Life, has charge of me. And when the time comes for me to go, he'll speak to death as the porter. And he'll say, Porter, open the door and let Mike in. Let my son Mike come into this upper room. And I'm just going to move through the door of death into the presence of the Lord. See? Now, see, death is, is death belongs to, to me under the old economy. When a righteous man dies, he went down in Sheol. Now, when a righteous man dies, he goes into the presence of the Holy Spirit, or the presence of the Lord, the presence of God. Be with Jesus. All right, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 is another one. Whilst we're home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We are at home in the body. My home is my body. If you looked after your house, do you look after your house? Well, your body's your house. So you look after it. Look after your house. You know, Jesus has bought your body. It's his. He's the landlord. And uh, the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians says this. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God your body. And know you not that your body are the members of Christ as well. I'll never forget when that came to me for the first time. I always taught that in the spirit, I was joined to the Lord. I was in the vine, and and uh, my spirit was joined with the Lord. But when I read that my physical body is a member of Christ, well, there we go. My physical body. I had to start thinking about it a little more. And if God has bought my body, and it's now his property, then I'm to look after it, steward, on the temple of the Holy Spirit, that I might worship him, not only with singing and praise and worship and my spirit and soul, but with my body as well taking care of it. Not only is my residence, our residence for the Spirit and I to dwell together in here in my body. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Makes you think a little differently what you do with it. Who you do with it. There's a lot of things you do with it. A lot of things which, let's say you're in a house with somebody else's homes. They're responsible to take care of the maintenance of it and the major repairs. You take care of the other ones, but the major ones he does if he owns it. So with sickness and disease, I just 
go to him about it because I can't fix it. And uh, I, uh, I work it. I tell him I have a body and uh, I am a spirit and I have a body. You don't see me. I'm a spirit. I don't see you. You're a spirit. I look at you through my eyes. It's a very complex being human beings are. Now I'm talking to you through my mouth. But I'm inside my thoughts and my ways. They're there already. They're inside there. Man, you're in there. And that's why I'm I'm preaching. You smile at me, but all the time inside, as I minister to you, you may not believe a word I'm saying. And later on, you might tell somebody, I heard him, but I don't believe in anything he said. Okay. I couldn't tell unless I perceive, unless the Holy Spirit lets me know. And I was very sensitive about that over the years. Still am. I think you try to understand from the Word of God we see something in the structure of our being that gives us the ability to intelligently relate to ourselves in the light of God's truth. Now, I'm going to make one more point here. And uh, I think it's important that this be said. I'm going to start out by saying that most of you won't disagree with until it starts to amplify it somewhat. Maybe then you will, but then we're going to have to, to, to talk about it more. When God saved me, Mike, he saved me. He did not replace me with something else or with a new spirit or with a new soul or with a new man, the old man and the new man. You have to understand what those things mean. For years I was taught that, uh, and not that long, but I had an old man from the old timers. Some of them taught this. I had a new man, an old man. And I was in here. There was something going on in there. I mean, I was there too. Everything bad, I blamed on the old man. And everything good, I credited with the new man. And I acted kind of a referee on the inside. I was the umpire, the referee. I made, you know, distinctions. And so there were really three of us in there, old man, new man, and me. And uh, old man, new man, and me. Huh. Now, and that didn't make sense to me. So I kept reading and learning, but I found to prove that that was orthodox that every once in a while I had to give evidence that the old man was there. So we'd let him do whatever. See, I told you that's my old man. Old man did that. So I could say the devil did it. And when something good happens, I said, that's my new man. Now, I don't have an old man or an old woman. Depends on what, who you are or what you are now. <laughs> and I don't have... A new man or a new woman. I am Mike Baker. That's it. And the old man is the old corporate endemic being. In Romans 5, Paul said this In Adam, in Adam, by the disobedience of one man, all were made sinners by disobedience of one, we all missed it and when we're made righteous by one man too adam's the old man the corporate adam christ is the new man the corporate christ us if you're born again you're either in the old man or you're in the new man one or the other now if you're in the old man then you are living under demonic influence and powers in the old society of the old edemic order but when you became a christian you came out of the old man and he brought into the new man, the new Christos order, which is corporate Christ, the body of Christ, Christians. But it's not something in you, it's something that you're in. And what's that in me that gives me problems in? That's you. It's just you, nobody else, nothing else, it's just you. Now, for years, that's where we were, new man, old man, new man, old man. And you're taught this dichotomy and tension. So I find a lot of people there. I was taught that, that uh, I had an old fella and a new fella. And I was taught that the old fella needed to be starved. And we had to wait till we died before this could be taken care of in the first place. The old fella. Now, one day I was doing research on Romans 6, which I've read all the time. Romans was one of the first things I did. And, and I always looked at commentators, several of them I didn't like. And I very seldom, we very seldom uh, look at those that we don't, like because they don't care for him too much. And in this commentary, Romans 6, she said this. He said, it's rather strange that some my brethren believe that they will 
not get to the point of victory over sin until they're dead. He said, isn't it interesting that they give more power to human death than they do to the death of Jesus Christ and his power and resurrection? And then I, I slammed it and, and I know. So I may not like it, but I do know that's true. That's too, true, 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 true. Too late now. He uh, got me through his commentary and uh, it, it came up. He saw it in a flash and I said to meditate on it and characterize this and my own theological views about this and they come out like this. Oh, blessed terminal cancer, come quickly and deliver me from the sin. <laughs> or old. Oh, sanctification comes through age too. Or heart attack, set me free from sin, please. And the more I characterize this and how stupid it was, it's more stupid it sounded. Then I realized that I had been attributing to the enemy, death, the power to deliver me from sin it was the enemy's death. From the power to deliver me from sin was not my dying. It was Christ dying on the cross for me and preaching the power of sin and rising from the dead to put a new life principle inside of me that into my spirit would come the spirit of God, which is the spirit of life, and Satan would have to go, that my mind would be renewed, my body would come under a new order of oversight, and my whole being would be changed. And there's a fight, but that's, that's all right. And I've said that more times than one, I've cried out and thank God I can be changed, and I do not have to live a sin repentant life continuously. Did you think you were changed? I did, but I didn't have, after a few years, kind of got held out till the end. Maybe something else would kill me, and then I'd be free from it. The blessed victory of death, would be, I'll be there. <laughs> no. It's now. How do you apply it? Oh, spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And what happens to us? You start to send the word up through your hearing, and you're seeing. You send the word up there from your spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes down, and everything you read from your body, and the material you read, the demonic powers came down and interpreted for you and created your your thought patterns which meant your behavior and all your thought patterns were translated into behavior patterns and that can be supernatural as well now what happens then the demonic stuff's canceled out and the holy spirit's back on the picture the holy spirit comes down and he can't do it alone he'll do it with you he's called the player the helper peter said this as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word so as soon as you're saved filled with the spirit you get in the word and it starts to send the word right up, up into your soul you used to send all kinds of rot up there filth and dirt and philosophical gobbledygook and all kinds of weird even weird christian stuff with demonic powers and would try to interpret that for you and you form all kinds of behavior patterns from your thought patterns and you fantasize about what it's supposed to be and it's, it's just a mess was solid but straight the holy spirit does now holy spirit comes down the word goes up and the spirit and the word get together in the soul and they mingle in the laboratory of your inner man and it starts to make changes the word and the spirit the word of god comes to you and you say hey look at that the holy spirit just showed you another thing and then another thing and another thing and i believe what he just said i read that and i believe that i say amen to it it's yours if you'll say it to it, the Holy Spirit will give it to you, and he tell you sometimes what to do. <clears throat> so he builds the word in you. Speaking, confessing, and doing. At times he'll tell you to say it again, say it again, say it again, say it again. And the word dominated. It starts dominating. You start dominating you. The word, the body responds to the word. The body responds to your soul. And you start to function as a, a word-governed man and woman. A word-governed man and woman. A word-governed person. The Holy Spirit in you enables you to respond to the Word. And you haven't got anybody there to blame. You haven't got anybody there to credit. Except the Lord who has come into your life by the Holy Spirit. God's changing you. God's changing your mind. God's changing your temperament. You can't blame somebody else. Somebody who's not here. Your old nature and your old man is just as old as you are. Uh, that's what you want to call it. You only have one nature. You don't have two natures or three natures. You have one nature. God's changing you. When you know something, when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, you can't say the devil did it. You can't say the old man did it or, or Eve did it or whoever did it. Every man will be judged out of the, the books according to his deeds. 
Why? Because you're morally responsible. Now, I want to lay something on you here. I'm kind of gentle, but still lay it on you. Are you listening? You and I are totally, ultimately, and completely responsible for what happens to us in our own actions and what we do. Can't do can't blame the devil. We can't blame an old man. Can't blame another Christian. We can't blame anybody else. We are morally responsible for our own actions. Now, if we're in trouble and we can't handle, we're still responsible. So we better get to the right place to get some help to get out of that problem, even if we can't handle it. I'm morally responsible for my life. I have to had, I have to handle my own life situations. You do. There is no substitute for the Word of God. Just send in the Word of God. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Richly. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Richly. Thick. Beautiful. Richly. Richly. Get it all out. Read it. Read it and read it and read it and read it some more. Hunks of it. Chunks of it. Read it. Read it. Read it. I called it power lifting when I was young. Read that word, power lift it. Read it, read it, read it, read it. There's sometimes I sit down and read 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 and read. Just labor at it and read and read and read and read and read. I don't do Bible studies and grammar times and just read it. You just read it for you to read it like eating. Like eat the sandwich and eat the dinner. Then eat a great dinner. Practice it. Read five Psalms every morning and one chapter in the book of Proverbs. You'll read the, through the whole Psalms and Proverbs once a month, all of them. And if you read through the Psalms once a month, you're feeding your soul on the spiritual life as it's supernaturally inspired and revealed through the Psalmist. All of human experience in relationship to God, you'll find them in the Psalms. Every one of them are there. Everything's there for you. Now you come to the Proverbs and all horizontal human relationships are there, are found in the Proverbs. How to intercede, interact, and interplay with humans. Domestic problems, personal problems, interpersonal relationships, it's all in the Proverbs. Everything's there. Now if you fill your heart with both the Psalms and the Proverbs, plus the rest of the Word, the Bible, you're getting an education on how God wants you to live, not only in relationship to Him, but in your relationship to others as well. Now you read these and you say, that's too hard for me, I can't do that. But uh, you have the Holy Spirit again to enable you to do this. So that the Holy Spirit now is the one who gives you the energy and the power that the devil used to give you. Now he does. Now remember the kind of energy the devil gave you? Yeah, he used to energize you to do all the things that were wrong. Now he's gone and the Holy Spirit is there. A greater has come in. The Holy Spirit has come in to the sanctum sanctorum of your very being. He has renewed your mind, quickened my body, and now my body is the willing slave to my spirit renewed by the Holy Spirit and my renewed soul, so that I now personally am being changed. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can be changed. Now, as you listen to so many people here can think of areas you need changed in. And uh, nobody's raising their hand, I can see. <laughs> sinners one and all. Huh? Or a bunch of sinners that need to be changed. Now, I think that's where you need to be honest with yourselves. You can just stop your confession stuff. I confess that I can do all things in Christ. Now, I'm glad that God, de He delivered me from theology a long time ago. Well, a long time ago. The Bible says that God has predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son. Now, somebody said, I'd like to be like Billy Graham or Dale Moody or whoever. I mean, there's a thousand different people, but I think your sights are too low. I think you need to be like Jesus. I never wanted to be like anybody else. I just want to be like him. In my mind, I hang around with him. When I read the Bible, I'm walking with him. He's a pattern son. I could be like him. And once I figured out how he spoke and thought and is, and read the word, I can only get that by the word. But it's kind of a higher goal, but it's a high quality that I have to attain to, too. He gave me the inspired word. He gave me the Holy Spirit. His angels minister to me. Everything that belongs to me has been given to me through Christ. You can't do this without the Word. Are you all listening? Spirit, soul, and body? You can't do this without the Word. The spirits won't do it. Talks in tongues won't do it. Singing chorus won't do it. 
you have got to block out time time to feed your soul now you know, Bosworth used to say this if our body got as little food as our souls do well it wouldn't look like we look <laughs> all things being equal amen a little meal on Sunday morning and a light snack on Wednesday night if you go to church and then we wonder why we're so spiritually anemic most of the time people just don't do it I don't feel good well yeah you're hungry and you got to renew your body feed my sheep he said the Lord told me that feed my sheep feed my sheep that's the word three meals a day huh three is an interesting number three meals a day three times a day Daniel got in touch with God now I'm not telling you how you should do it but you got to start somewhere yeah, you don't, you know, just don't let it go. Just take it in and say, well, that's okay. But I'm going to ask you this. How many of you sit down and, and literally eat the word? I mean, just gobble it up. Eat it. Oh, the word is good. I told the Lord that all the time. I love your word. Just eat it. Uh, the Bible uses that term, eat the word. Brother, that's one area where gluttony is not a sin, is eat that word. You don't get fat on that word. You get strong in that word. Eat it. Until you're so full that you're just full of the word. And then go explode it on somebody. Now, when you fill yourself with the word, there's a logos and, and uh, the rhema. There's a difference. The logos is the word, the Bible. The rhema is when the Holy Spirit reaches down into the wrist deposit of the word that you put down inside there. And he says now, we're going to confront the situation with this. Now, this is a type of God does. You remain talk to you about different things, but this is the average overall what the Rima means. He'll take this one or that one from the word, and that's what he's going to use. But it has to be there for him to take. I like the living word. There's the, the living word. They sit around waiting for prophecy to come and they didn't read the Bible anymore. They didn't even take the Bible to church. There's the living words. You can't get a living word until you put the written word in there so the Holy Spirit would have something to put out there. This is not right after Pentecost. He put the word together for a reason for you. It's canonized just for you so you can read the word. It's his thought in his mind. You don't need to prophesy all night long. It can happen. Prophecy is part of it. But that's called the real word churches. I don't believe them. Now, as you put this word in you and as you walk in the Lord, the Holy Spirit will reach down and take the word and bring it up to your mind and or quicken it in you. Uh, it helped me. I didn't become so spiritual. I'm so stupid. When our Lord went in the wilderness, let's use that example. He was tempted. He was tempted as the last Adam. The first Adam had been tempted, and he didn't make it. He fell. Jesus went into the wilderness as a man. And I don't have time to document all this, but hear me out and hear me carefully. I've got a few minutes to say this. Listen. The second chapter of Philippians tells us this. That when Jesus came, he emptied himself of his divine prerogative and authority and privilege. Jesus did not come down here in the right of deity of the second person of the Trinity. He divested himself. It's a mystery. I don't know how he did it. But it's a revelation, it's a mystery, and I can't comprehend it. He had emptied himself of all his divine prerogatives. He didn't stop being what he was, but in a mystery, which we can't comprehend, he divested himself of all prerogatives as the second person of the Trinity, or the Logos, the Word. And he came down and he was made in the likeness of man. It's a, a great mystery. It's great that in the womb of that little peasant girl, Mary, the Bible says that God had, had just made a body for Jesus. It says that. And into that body, the Logos came. And a man child was born. His son was born in Mary. Now, this son was God a very God and 
man a very man, but he had deliberately set aside the prerogative of his deity. Now, this will help you if you can grasp this. Because people say, who could be like Jesus? He was God. He was and he wasn't, if you understand this and understand me. He was God because the divine nature was there. But by an act of, an act of will, an act of divine will, he set it aside. He divested himself of it, of all the power, that, the rights that use that divinity. He wouldn't use it. He had to be a man. He was a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. And people said he couldn't yield to the temptation. If he couldn't yield to the temptation because of divinity, it would be not a temptation. It wouldn't be a temptation at all anyway. Now, if his temptations were not valid temptations, then he's no help to me at all, is he? The Bible says, because he was tempted at all points as I am, I have some hope. Now, if he was tempted and he couldn't respond, then he's no help to me at all. What does he know about a bottle of temptation and all the mess we go through? Now, when he went into the wilderness and Satan confronted him, he did not have in deity, he didn't do it. He didn't act in deity. He acted in obedience to humanity. His father spoke to him. Everything he did, he did as a man in response to his father as his father mediated his will to him through the Holy Spirit and the Word. And when he faced his satanic majesty and all the wilderness temptations and Satan came at him just as subtly, as cleverly as as he come after Eve and Adam in the garden, in the garden of Eden, Jesus did what Adam didn't do. You see, when Satan came to Eve, he made one mistake. He should have said to that serpent, Adam should have, I don't speak to strange serpents. I just don't do it. Now, if you want to talk to me, you wait till I call my husband. That's what she should have said to him. Now, he may have run that risk and she called Adam and Adam come over he, he ran that risk and Adam would address Adam hello now Adam took his proper place he would have said excuse me I don't talk to strangers and strange serpents but if you want to come back this evening about five o'clock my boss will be here and whom I have submitted to will be here for evening tea and then if he wants to talk we'll talk or he could have put a shotgun and shot him guard and tend but he didn't have one. Adam acted independently of God, and he got in trouble. Independent. And he moved out from underneath God. And he got in trouble. How many times did the devil come to you and you get mad at him, cuss at him? Because it's not what God did. I know what Jesus did. I'll, I'll turn these rocks into bread if I want to, but I won't. Now, Jesus is confronting Satan in the wilderness, and Satan sends a clever word to him. Father, which one do I use, Jesus? And Jesus said, okay, I'll try this one, right? Now, the word that Jesus used on Satan in the wilderness wasn't any old word in the Bible. It was a word that the Spirit took out of the, the rich deposit, which was the, the beautiful word inside of him. He just didn't take a word to it. From a child, he knew. He ate it. I think he gobbled that word up when he was a boy. At 12 years old, like many Jewish boys, excited about the temple and wide-eyed and happy and excited for the first time like that. And he was undoubtedly disappointed by what he saw. And he read the Bible. And lately I've had a few Christians I've talked to. They're just so disappointed with what they think they should see in church. That not much of the word has come out anyway. What does come out, it's not, it's not wise. It's not wisdom. And they're just heartbroken inside. He was full of the word, Jesus was. He went up to the temple. and You remember Mary and Joseph? We're in that caravan. We're going home, all the relatives. And Suddenly they missed Jesus. And they said, well, where's the Lord? He said, well, he has to be with Uncle Zacharias, or the cousins or whatever. And he liked Uncle Zacharias, with John's, John's daddy. And Joseph went over to see if Jesus was with Uncle Zacharias. And he said, he's not here. Where is he? So they went over to cousin somebody else, and they found Jesus wasn't there either. And then they went back, and there he was in the temple. Now, he wasn't standing on a podium with a halo around his head and making great regal pronouncements. In the word, he was just a young 12-year-old Jewish boy talking to the rabbis. And he'd say, sirs, what do you think about this? What does this mean? 
and the rabbis would try to answer through his rabbinical theology, probably using the tumult, 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 uh, tumult. And Jesus had a fresh word, maybe you think of my doing this? And he would talk about that. And when the parents came back, the rabbi said, we didn't hear anybody like this. This kid knows so much about the bird, he, so much about the Bible. Oh, what did we do with him? Uh, he stored it up, and then it came out at the right moment. Now, he's been baptized in the water, and Father declared him to be his son. Now, whether that's the first time into his, his subconsciousness is something for the Lord to argue about, but I don't. He just is. He is what he is, and I know that. Period. Yeah. People go work it out, use that out. Call it theologians. I always say theologians. <clears throat> when he went in that wilderness, he was tempted. <coughs> he, was, he was totally dependent on the Spirit of God to give him the rhema, and he was. He had the logos in him. He filled himself up. Since he was little, he continually filled himself up. He filled himself up with logos. Now he's 30, and the Holy Spirit reached down, grabbed one of them words, and pulled it back up, and made it a living word, and said this, and shoot it back at Satan through his lips. Pow! Take out his sword, and stab him, and put it back in his sheet. Satan came at him a second time. Which one now, Lord? And the Spirit of God gave him another one. He pulled it out, and he said it. Boom! Three times he thrust him through with his sword. And the Bible says that Satan left him for a season to come back. But every time he came back, Jesus got a rhema, stuck him with it every time. How much more us? Now, the only reason that Jesus lived the way he did is because he lived in absolute obedience to the Father. He learned obedience through, through things he suffered. And the Bible says that in the days of his flesh, without Christ, he vehemently cried to him who was able to save him. There were times when the temptation was so tough that Jesus just stood there and fought, screamed, Father, 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 Father. How much more us? You, you say Jesus actually did that? Yeah, the people said it loud cries and tears. He screamed, help, help me. Jesus wouldn't do that. Yeah, he would, he did. He was a human. Put down his deity and you're supposed to do it too. Don't be an idiot, cry out. You get in a tough spot, help. His name is Jesus. I taught this one lady, she was in such hard despair. I mean, I said, oh, we just need Jesus. That's it. For uh, two hours, we just walked around and screamed, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now, a lot of people said, that's irreverent. It's wrong. And I said, well, you keep talking like that. You're going to be in trouble anyway because you're too irreverent yourself. Now, the devil didn't like that, me screaming, Jesus, because Jesus showed up. Sometimes I prayed 14, 15, 16, 17 hours, and the Holy Spirit showed up and says, well, what do you want? This. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why. It says that Jesus was tempted in all points like we. Now, there's nothing that Jesus has not gone through. He came through it the same way you can come through it, if you will. You have to depend on the Holy Spirit and obedience to the Father to be the right kind of person to respond to the Word. Big old tears come out of people's eyes when you teach them that and bring them into that. And... Uh, I think we all go through so much stuff that we just don't use the word. We try to resist, though, but they have never been taught how to. They need help, true help, real help, lots of help. And the Lord will help you. Now, we think, is it right to think? Is it, was it right to me to think and talk to God about horrible things that are happening to us and what we're going through? They won't even talk to God about it. And I told them, yes, you talk to God about that. You're not telling the Lord nothing new. He's heard it all. He knows. He's just waiting for you to call on him because that's the way it works. He can't call on him unless you release him. Release the word and release Jesus. you got to release Jesus first. That's the rules. you got to scream, help. Help. Save me and help me. Help me. Help me. Angels come from everywhere when you do that. They just, they do. Help. Hallelujah, Lord. Let's say praise the Lord and hallelujah. Spirit, soul, and body. I know it's not the glorious spirit, soul, and body you want to hear, but that's the way it is. And they think this is the truth. This is Mike. I'll see you next time. Jesus is Lord.